All right. Well, uh, good uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, important webinar that uh, we're hosting uh, in conjunction with Hong Kong Watch, an opportunity for uh, Canadian parliamentarians, their staff, and for all of you uh, who are joining us watching this live stream on Facebook uh, to hear from some uh, really eminent speakers about the situation uh, in Hong Kong. My name is uh, Garner Jenis. I'm a member of parliament from Short Park, Port Saskatchewan, uh, and I'm pleased to be co-hosting this uh, discussion uh, with Kenny Chu, a member of parliament from British Columbia. And I see uh, various uh, parliamentary colleagues from, uh, from other parts of the country, other parties uh, and staff joining us on the call. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, I won't go too much into the, the details of the situation in, in Hong Kong in this introduction because uh, we have uh, so many speakers uh, who, who will be doing that. Um, but just by way of, of general introduction, I wanted to uh, uh, give my best wishes to all of you as, as we're dealing with uh, the, the challenge created by COVID-19 uh, and encourage you to remember that uh, around the world, we are seeing uh, escalating abuses of fundamental human rights uh, where uh, governments are trying to take advantage of the situation uh, that exists. Uh, they are trying to take advantage of the fact that uh, many of us are, are distracted and focused on, uh, on other issues. Uh, they are trying to take advantage of uh, the, uh, the legitimate need to uh, address uh, security questions uh, by, uh, by increasing the power of the state at the expense of, uh, of people. So while we deal with the, the, the challenges created by COVID-19, we must be ever vigilant in our defense of fundamental human rights. And uh, that is why it is critical for us to continue the conversation about abuses of fundamental human rights that are happening uh, in Hong Kong, recognizing that uh, human rights abusers have not taken a break uh, because of, uh, of this pandemic. And therefore, uh, those of us who are seized with the importance of, of defending human rights, defending justice, uh, cannot uh, take a break uh, as well. Um, so, so thank you for recognizing the, the importance of that and for uh, being part of this, uh, this conversation. Uh, one of the things about uh, the current circumstances are that um, in a way it makes it uh, easier for us to, to convene conversations uh, among people from all over the world. Uh, before this, when people were uh, less familiar with these, uh, these platforms, it was maybe a bit harder to get uh, uh, people in Hong Kong right now, people in the UK, people in Canada, people in different parts of Canada uh, together, but, uh, but now we're able to, uh, to do that. So uh, we are uh, in the midst of this uh, global crisis, seizing the moment uh, to continue the important work uh, to, to stand up for justice and, and human rights. So I'll turn it over uh, now as part of the introduction to my colleague, uh, Kenny Chu. Kenny uh, was newly elected in uh, in 2019, just, just last year, and he is already emerging as a, as a real leader on human rights issues. Uh, and he's someone who uh, knows the situation in Hong Kong uh, particularly well for reasons that uh, maybe he'll get into. Uh, but he also participated in an election observer mission, um, literally, I think, a month or a couple months after, after getting elected. So uh, not wasting any time, but, uh, but using uh, the opportunities that come with the office to, uh, to stand up for, for important values and principles. So Kenny, uh, it's great to be able to work with you on this and, uh, and take it away. Well, thank you, Garnet. Uh, hello to uh, all of you who are in attendance. I'd like to begin by thanking you all for um, joining me and Garnet here uh, with Hong Kong Watch. I, for one, believe the relationship between Canada and Hong Kong is very important, and I hope to represent that as a member of parliament uh, of Canada. This belief is founded in good reason. Canada has had a deep historical involvement with uh, both the people and the territory of Hong Kong. Uh, in 1941, it was Canadian soldiers from Winnipeg and Quebec City uh, that defended the then British colony of Hong Kong from Japanese invasion. Though they were overwhelmed and eventually defeated, they fought valiantly. Canada paid to see uh, Hong Kong protected with the blood of over 550 of its citizens, forever memorialized in the Sai Wan Memorial. 
before the return of Hong Kong to China, Canada sought and received assurance from both the government of People's Republic of China and the government of the United Kingdom that under the proposed one country, two systems framework, there would be no change for 50 years and that Hong Kong will have a high level degree of autonomy. And the people in Hong Kong would govern Hong Kong. Canada felt good about the return because our leaders believe Mr. Deng Xiaoping and his successors, uh, when they made the statements that China will uh, would not be would would be making a political transformation to modern norms of democracy and rule of law, etc., before these fifty years had passed. Ch Canada and Hong Kong share many values. Among these include uh, respect for rule of law, human rights, and individual freedoms. And, and what greater freedom is there than democratic political participation? Following the return, Hong Kong basic law was enacted as a guarantee of these. Under the one country, two system model, the ruling Chinese Communist Party, or in short, the CCP, it's supposed to honor the agreement of the basic law. The CCP was also supposed to honor the agreements made in the UN co co covenant on civil and political rights through rectification, a promise made to Canada for offering China much development, developmental aid. The CCP has failed in these respect, and that shows a lack of respect for Canada, for Hong Kong and for Canadians and Hong Kong values. The knowledge of the appetite for power of the CCP and the destruction it, it brings drove people to leave Hong Kong and come to Canada and around the world, millions of them. Their instincts were proven right when watching the 1989 Tiananmen massacre and how we are seeing pro-democracy advocates are being treated. This instinct that this regime cannot be trusted has been proven correct again. Canada should continue its history of involvement with Hong Kong. It is owed to the over 300,000 Canadians that live there and the generations of Hong Kongers adopted Canada as their home. It is owed to the memory of the Canadians who fought and died to protect that territory. And it is owed to the citizens of Hong Kong who have yearned for the keeping of promises to allow them to live their way of life in an open and free and democratic manner. This is why there will be time for action, but for now together, we must keep watch for Hong Kong. Thank you, back to you, Garnet. Well, thank you uh, so much, Kenny. And uh, we're, we're so blessed to have you uh, in our parliament, in our caucus. Uh, with the, uh, the passion as well as the wealth of knowledge and experience uh, that you bring. Uh, I'm uh, pleased now to be able to introduce our first speaker. Uh, before I do that, I'll just remind everyone that uh, in addition to having this webinar, this, this event is streaming on Facebook. Uh, so those who are with us, feel free to, to share it on Facebook from, uh, from, from my page uh, if you see it. And if you're watching it on Facebook, please like and share it so that more people can see uh, this important uh, conversation as it happens. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Martin Lee, uh, the great Martin Lee, is someone who needs, needs no introduction to, I'm sure, most of those who are familiar with the topic. Uh, but, uh, but for those who are less uh, familiar, uh, Martin Lee is, is uh, known as the father of democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, he's one of the most prominent advocates for democracy uh, and human rights with a, with a very long history of taking strong and principled positions around uh, these issues. He was the founding chairman of the Democratic Party in Hong Kong, and he has been uh, for, for a long time a member of the Legislative Council there, specifically from 1985 to 1997, and from 1998 to 2008. Uh, he was one of 15 people arrested in April 2020 uh, in, in this uh, horrifying uh, effort to, to arrest and, and intimidate uh, some of Hong Kong's uh, most prominent champions uh, for freedom, human rights, and democracy. Uh, Mr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're, you're a hero to so many uh, on this call and who are watching, so appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear some words directly from you. 
Thank you very much for hosting this webinar. Um, I will pick it up from uh, Kenny. The one country, two systems was what was described as China's basic policies regarding Hong Kong. This was the brainchild of Deng Xiaoping, at least we attribute that to him. And uh, his one country, two systems um, were described by him as Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy, namely, apart from defense and foreign affairs, which are properly reserved to the central government under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and therefore our mini constitution, the basic law, we, the Hong Kong people, were promised to have, to be masters of our own house in terms of the executive, legislative, and judicial power. Now, about five years ago, in June, 2014, six years now, the central government published a white paper in seven languages claiming that the central government, that is the Communist Party, has comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong. Now that phrase should be more properly translated as having complete administrative power over Hong Kong. Now just imagine, if the Communist Party has complete administrative power over Hong Kong, what degree of autonomy do we have? None. That's the extent to which they have now rewritten the one country, two system. And that everything you've been seeing recently and more will come very soon is but the implementation of that policy. It's not a new policy. It was it's already six years old, but no government took heed of that. I tried to explain to them, terrible things are going to happen, but we didn't see them happen a few years back. But this year and in, in the last few months, they changed the top man in the central government's liaison office in Hong Kong. These are the, the communist setup. They've got their office in the Western part of Hong Kong and they are now interfering with all the internal affairs of Hong Kong. They claim that they are, they are above the law, above the laws of Hong Kong and above the basic law. They were supposed not to interfere with Hong Kong's internal affairs as provided by Article 22 of the basic law, but they say, no, that doesn't apply to them. And th that took even the Hong Kong government completely by surprise, because all these years, we all understood that they were governed by the basic law, which is our mini constitution. But now we learned for the first time that this is not so. Now, the whole idea of one country, two systems was implemented in a very simple manner. So after 1997, the Chinese constitution will continue to govern China. But now it has become mainland China because there is now Hong Kong added to it as a special administrative region together with the Macau Special Administrative Region. And Hong Kong was governed and is governed by the Hong Kong Basic Law, which I helped to draft. And Macau is governed by the Macau Basic Law, while the rest of China mainland is governed by the Chinese Constitution. But now they say the Chinese Constitution can trump the Hong Kong Basic Law. That means everything is now at large. All those promises are now to be rewritten they will give Hong Kong people as many freedoms and as high an extent of freedom as they please every given day. So if today they say, okay, I'll give you more freedom, fine. Tomorrow they can take a lot of that back. Now this is not, this cannot work. And that is why without democracy, they keep on postponing it. And with the continued exercise of comprehensive power now over Hong Kong, the one country, two system policy of Deng Xiaoping has been, is, has been standing on its head. I hope my overseas friends will understand the extent of this intrusion into Hong Kong by the Chinese Communist Party. It cannot be trusted, I'm afraid. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh... Thank you so much for that. Kenny, would you like to introduce our next uh, couple speakers here? 
Sure, Garnet. Uh, took me a while to uh, switch back. Uh, the next speaker we have is uh, Mr. Lee Cher Yen. Uh, Lee Cher Yen, Xin Zhang. He was a part of, uh, member of the Legislative Council of Hong Kong from 1995 to 2016. He's a trade union leader and general secretary of the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, as well as former chairman of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements in China. He is the co-founder of the Labour Party and uh, one of 15 activists arrested in April 2020. Uh, Mr. Lee, over to you. It's been an honor and uh, over to you, yeah. Um, thank you. I'm very glad to join this meeting. And I will really congratulate the meeting because you guys are really having a very good timing. Because as uh, Martin had mentioned, the intrusion of China into Hong Kong is now being demonstrated now at this moment in Beijing. What is happening now? Actually, you know, I'm receiving a lot of phone calls from uh, local press because everyone is asking us for a reaction to what is happening in Beijing. What is happening now is suddenly today, actually tonight, they announced that, that the intention of the National People Congress meeting in Beijing to introduce what they call a Hong Kong version of national security law into Hong Kong. And what is the meaning of that? It means that they are introducing it by passing it into from Beijing, by the National People Congress, without going through even the pretense of going through the Hong Kong Legislative Council. So it's a direct, very, very direct intervention. They transplant the whole uh, uh, part of the law into Hong Kong. And they are claiming that they would not want to draft the law for Hong Kong and pass it in August this year, lightning speed. And what is the meaning of that law? You all have to remember the major attack on human rights in China is the law on subversion. So anything, you know, any uh, freedom of speech, any criticism of, of, of the Chinese government, they will charge, will, charge you with uh, subversion of uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, government. And like Liu Xiaobo, the, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, advocating for democracy in the 08, and then he was charged in prison for 11 years and died during the prison. And so what is happening now, they are saying that, the national security law will apply to Hong Kong, including uh, subversion, sedition, and including uh, that uh, foreign intervention. So they will try to ban foreign intervention into Hong Kong. And I'm seeing ban now, you know, ban have been banned from coming to Hong Kong. And I'm sure that uh, he will not be able to come again if this, especially when this law get passed, imagine. And then, you know, what about people like us? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Hong Kong, apart from the general secretary of the Hong Kong Confederation Trade Union, as part of the labor movement in Hong Kong. I'm also the ch uh, chairman of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movement in China. We was formed in 1989, as Candy had mentioned, you know, people, uh, become very alarmed because of 989 massacre and the movement uh, 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 arises out of this uh, uh, tension during 89 and want to fight for democracy for Hong Kong and also China. And then uh, that this is the movement that every year we have the June 4th candlelight vigil. And I will try to explain what is happening now today because the attack is so many many facets, many prone attack on our uh, civil liberty. And one of the latest one uh, on the June 4th candlelight vigil, which we've been holding for 30 years, now this 31st year. And I very much remember in 97, people are say, asking us, can we have a candlelight vigil to condemn the massacre after 97? And people say, oh, maybe not. But then 
things seems to be quite, uh, you know, in a way uh, allowing us to have the commemoration. And uh, we have 180,000 people coming out for the candlelight vigil last year. So it showed a strong support uh, for uh, the, uh, the condemnation of the massacre. But now this year, they use the excuse of the, uh, what they call ban of gathering re regulation under the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, regulation to ban all gathering. And now, and, and they try to ban the gathering and they, they extend it every 14 days. So it, the, the next, the, the, the next round will be up to June 4th, okay? So June 4th, they will not allow us to get up. And original, originally, I thought, oh, you guys are targeting June 4th candlelight vigil so that we cannot hold it. And, and exactly, of course, that's the fact. We cannot hold it. And, but of course, we will still go be, and be defiant and I will still go to Victoria Park and I call upon the people, all the people of Hong Kong to still light the candle in, 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 in remembrance of those who sacrificed democracy. But now tonight, I find out that they are not just targeting on the candlelight vigil. They are also targeting and of all resistance and protest after they passed the national security law resolution on Hong Kong tonight. So actually they have everything planned out to try to suppress any opposition by using the excuse of the pandemic against the civil liberty in Hong Kong. But that is really totally absurd because in Hong Kong, I think the situation is very different from other places. We people are very careful about wearing masks and so social distancing. And now, you know, actually the, the government announced that schools are opening and everything sort of back to usual. Uh, religious gathering is still, is now allowed, but they don't allow us for political gathering. And that's the situation now in Hong Kong. And so it's really worrying further down because all pretense in the past, they have a mass of pretense. Oh, they are respecting one country, two system. Now they are all you know, ripping out the, the, the pretense, the mass of uh, that they are respecting one country, two system. And now what they are doing, arresting Martin Lee and, and us, you know, and actually 8,400 people have been arrested, 1,300 something people have been prosecuted and they are seeking jail sentence for young people, police violence is still going on, I can go on and on. But what I'm trying to tell you guys is that, you know, the civil society have been very strong in Hong Kong over the past uh, years. You know, uh, the, um, the trade union, the religious sector, uh, the, the churches, uh, the student uh, movement, F, you know, we have a very strong base and we have been resisting the Communist Party interfering in Hong Kong for many and fighting for that democracy. We have this base. They are now trying to destroy our base by attacking every sector of the society. And it really is very much of a total many prone attack over civil liberty and the civil society that I think, you know, it's really very alarming now. And uh, we really hope that the world stand with us because they are challenging the world. Every, as Kenny mentioned that, you know, Canadian government witnessed the, uh, uh, the joint declaration. And everyone think that, oh, you guys, uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, can have a good protection. But no, what happened now is that, you know, the whole thing, the pretense have been off. And so we need really the support. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Um, Garnet, over to you to introduce the next speaker. Uh, okay, uh, sure. Um, just uh, hang on one sec here. Bear with me. Um, all right, well, thank you. Uh, for a, another excellent uh, presentation. I'm pleased to now be able to introduce Avery Ng, uh, a Hong Kong politician and social activist. He is the chairman of the League of Social Democrats, a pro-democracy social democratic party in Hong Kong. He's led massive protests along with the Civil Human Rights Front. Uh, and he was also one of uh, the 15 activists that was, uh, that was arrested in April, 2020. Three of the leaders of his party were among those who were arrested. 
so thank you very much, uh, Avery, for joining us and look forward to your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, what can I say? Uh, the situation in Hong Kong is extremely dire. And I think uh, my colleagues can attest that whatever we are experiencing over the past six months, um, the deterioration of the rule of law, um, the encroachment of uh, the, our fundamental human rights, as well as the breakdown of the, uh, the trust between uh, the people and the government. Whatever happened over the past six months was so rapid and, and, and the scale is so huge that this uh, yeah, it, it, it has never seen before, ever since the handover. Um, now, I, I, I want to add on top of what uh, Richard Yan and Martin Lee were saying that um, maybe over the past, past decade or so, um, the rule of law in Hong Kong has been slowly breaking down uh, without, not, no, without uh, much notice uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the way that, uh, let's say, we still have a rule of law and independent court for, for you know, civil cases and for commercial uh, businesses. Uh, we still have the rule of law for your you know, petty crimes and your, you know, the real crimes, uh, and killers and rapists. However, if there's uh, any incidences or cases that's remotely relating to politics or remotely relating to uh, vested interests uh, with strong ties with CCP, then that's where the uh, rule of law breaks down. Um, uh, because, uh, the rule of law is as good as the law. Um, and the law in Hong Kong now uh, is up to interpretation by the CCP uh, more often than not. Um, so, uh, and the way that the, the government and the CCP has been playing uh, is that uh, they have been experimenting with uh, various criminal law or colonial laws to try to um, put pressure to politicians or dissidents uh, to send us to jail, to disqualify our elected members and people like, well, like, like myself, like the more radical wing of the uh, democratic country with you know, like real clashes with police. Um, but what makes the, our current uh, 15 leaders uh, case so significant is the fact that, I mean, come on, they are arresting Martin Lee, the, the grandfather of the... <laughs> Uh, democracy who never broke a single law uh, over the past many decades, uh, CCP has decided to make such a high profile arrest uh, at a time where the whole world is dealing with the pandemic. Now that is a strong message sending from CCP to the world in saying that they are not afraid of anyone, whether you are a young kid or whether you're Martin Lee, who's got a established international standing, they are going to do what they want. Now, imagine if that's what they, that they are doing now in the midst of a uh, pandemic. Well, try to imagine after the pandemic subsides, the crackdown will be even more severe. And what they are now doing is not only targeting the more radical uh, people, but they are interested by you know, normal they are not even allowing a candlelight ritual uh, in, in the Victoria Park. Uh, and, and from the looks of it, uh, with the CCP's tactic, the, uh, well, basically they are employing the tactic of uh, they, may, they may as well uh, attack us uh, all at once. Um, so that's why we hear that tonight. Uh, probably we are going to hear the announcement from the uh, MPC. Uh, in terms of that uh, new introduction of, of my personal expectation as well, that they can, they are, they are, uh, the CCP is pushing the button so soon and so hard to the point where if somehow the national security law uh, pass over the next few months, uh, you know, by means of their own interpre interpretation, this, this webinar would be a, a strong enough evidence uh, for them to arrest uh, all of us. Uh, and send us to jail, even with their trial, um, and and it will, and that's why it's um, especially important, I think, at this juncture that the international community uh, 
can really will really need to sit down and formulate a coherent international policy, uh, international policy and strategies in dealing with uh, CCP uh, in forcing their hand or somehow uh, force them to stop the human right violation. And it's just not just Hong Kong, but also in Xinjiang and, uh, and, uh, and, and Tibet and various parts of, uh, of China. Um, but uh, what, what I want to add is that uh, I understand that it will be extremely difficult. Um, for one, the, uh, uh, locally on the ground, it's, it's now getting harder and harder for us to mobilize people. Not that because people are not willing to mobilize, uh, but because of the fact that even they step out of their home and go to a shopping mall to join a random small uh, chanting, uh, they would face uh, arrest, if not uh, imprisonment. Uh, uh, and, and, and so the, the, the risk of uh, voicing out in Hong Kong locally is uh, getting greater and greater. Uh, and secondly, uh, CCP has been very cleverly employing their capital investment and their soft power uh, overseas. Uh, and, uh, and well, uh, in, in Canada, for example, that um, they, they, they've got a very strong support base in their local Chinese community, uh, and as well as the, the vested uh, investment interest uh, abroad, that it will make it a bit tough for foreign government, uh, you know, when you have to consider your constituencies and, and, you know, uh, and play the hand uh, with CCP. Uh, however, I, I have to uh, warn uh, you know, all, all of us that um, CCP will deploy all the necessary tools and capitals and soft power uh, to 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 let the international community, uh, you no, know, just do uh, you know, stop short of doing enough, ensure their support. Um, now, uh, if uh, uh, but by the by the ways of how we are progressing in Hong Kong and the deterioration of the rule of law. Uh, I, I think it is uh, sooner or later is uh, time for the international community to make a strong stance and I have to remind people that the joint declaration is uh, supposedly a international uh, ratified treaty uh, that uh, should be accountable. Uh, the CCP should be held ac accountable. Um, uh, however, and, and if, if uh, at the end of the day, uh, the international community uh, will end locally, uh, us, uh, fail to force uh, CCP to comply with the basic law. Uh, in a way, that means that CCP can do basically whatever they want uh, in the future, uh, even on the international scene. And that's, uh, again, it's not good for, uh, for, for, for uh, any other countries, even if you only consider local interest. Um, so it is paramount that uh, to recognize that the Hong Kong issue is not just a Hong Kong issue. Uh, it is an international issue uh, because the encroachment of Hong Kong oh, well, well, is very direct because we are just next door. But then the encroachment of uh, our, our, our universal shared value, our way of life uh, locally and internationally uh, will we'll, 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 uh, we'll get uh, even uh, more severe. Uh, if we allow the CCP's uh, hawkish and uh, bullying behavior continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Avery, for that. And, and all three of our, our speakers thus far for really compelling testimony about what's happening on the ground and uh, underlining for us uh, how imminent this, this conversation is, the things that are happening uh, as we speak and, and the fact that uh, that we need to, to do all we can to act. And, uh, and now we're gonna move into a bit more of a discussion about uh, uh, the- Garnet, pardon me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have another speaker uh, that uh, I'd like to introduce. Yeah, sorry, uh, go ahead, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the next speaker we have, it's Mr. Benedict Rogers, Law Gitsi Sinsang. He's a, human, a British human rights activist and journalist based in London. 
His work focuses on Asia, especially lately on Hong Kong and China. He's a regular contributor to many major national and international media around the globe. He is the co-founder and deputy chairman of the Conservative Party's Human Rights Commission and the co-founder of the International Coalition to Stop Crimes Against Humanity in North Korea. He's also the uh, East Asia team leader at a Christian Solidarity Worldwide and has written three books which focus on Burma and co-author two others on Christian human rights obligations. Perhaps most relevant to our webinar today it's that he is the co-founder of or he is the founder of Hong Kong Watch. Without further ado over to you Mr. Rogers. Well thank you very much indeed uh, and can I say first of all what a, a great honor and privilege it is to follow uh, our three extremely distinguished and courageous uh, speakers from Hong Kong. Three people I'm uh, privileged to to know personally uh, to, to varying degrees and to, to count as friends and heroes of mine who are really holding, uh, f fighting for uh, the freedom, I believe not only of their own city, but actually holding, trying to hold the front line of freedom uh, for the rest of us as well. And their arrest uh, just over a month ago, and as we've heard already, uh, the uh, uh, almost certain introduction of Article 23 uh, at the NPC in Beijing tonight um, is, uh, turning uh, the screw, uh, a sign that Beijing is turning the screws on Hong Kong at a, an extremely alarming uh, rate. And really the only two things I think that can uh, have a chance of, of uh, holding, uh, holding this off and uh, preventing uh, the total demise of one country, two systems uh, in Hong Kong are firstly the courage of the people of Hong Kong, uh, but also the efforts of the international community, which are uh, needed now more urgently and more robustly than ever. Uh, it's also a great privilege to, to speak at this event hosted by Garnet Generous and Kenny Chu, and I want to pay tribute to you for everything that you do uh, for Hong Kong and other human rights uh, issues. Uh, and I should say that every time I speak on Hong Kong, I either, if it's appropriate, I either carry a yellow umbrella as a symbol of my respect for the movement in Hong Kong, uh, clearly on a sunny day in London when I'm inside, I can't really hold a yellow umbrella, so instead I wear a yellow tie, and uh, that's my, my act of solidarity uh, with you. It, it may seem a little strange for uh, a Brit sitting in London to be talking to an audience largely uh, in Canada about what, what Canada should be doing, but I think, as has already been highlighted, there are clear close relationships between our three uh, homelands, uh, between Canada, the United Kingdom and Hong Kong, relationships based on, on some of our history together, but also on our shared values uh, of democracy, freedom and human rights. Uh, we uh, in Hong Kong Watch uh, recently published a report uh, called Why Hong Kong uh, Matters, uh, and I'm going to share some slides that, uh, that go with this. Uh, and uh, this report looks at the, the implications for China, uh, the international community, uh, including very much uh, Canada, um, if Beijing continues its increasingly hardline crackdown. So I want to spend just a few minutes before we go into questions, just presenting some insights from that report on uh, why Hong Kong matters uh, to us all and why it's in no one's interests for the city to lose its autonomy and its core freedoms. It's already been pointed out uh, that the ties between Hong Kong and Canada uh, run deep. Uh, you don't need me to remind you that uh, there are uh, currently, I believe, about 400,000 uh, Hong Kong Canadians, uh, 200 Canadian companies uh, in Hong Kong, another half a million Hong Kong immigrants and their descendants uh, living in Canada. Uh, and, and most Hong Kong immigrants uh, move to Canada precisely because they share your, indeed our, uh, values of liberty, democracy, and freedom. And so what happens in Hong Kong should be of real interest to everyone listening. If we go to the second slide, rather than focus now on those cultural ties, uh, our report uh, considers the ongoing significance of Hong Kong uh, as a major international financial center. There have been many uh, op-eds in different publications around the world uh, asking if we're seeing the end of Hong Kong. 
and whether uh, China will take action that will, will end one country, two systems. And our report lays out the ongoing uh, role of Hong Kong as an international financial center and the difficulties that it would face, uh, that the international financial system would face in finding an alternative to replace Hong Kong uh, if Hong Kong, uh, as, as we know it, uh, ends. The city is a key conduit uh, with its equity and debt markets uh, being used to attract foreign funds. Indeed, as the former chief secretary, the former head of the civil service uh, in Hong Kong, Anson Chan, said recently in the Financial Times, and I quote, in the wake of coronavirus, China already faces an uphill challenge to win back the trust of the international community. It cannot afford the further disgrace of one country, two systems collapsing in full view of the world. It would be the death knell for Hong Kong's role as Asia's pr premier financial services center with implications for banking, insurance, legal, and other trade-related services that underpin not just the Chinese, but wider uh, regional and global economies. Hong Kong is tiny in geographical terms, and I lived in Hong Kong for five uh, years, and I know the city well, um, but its unique uh, status uh, as uh, really the only open economy and free society within China's uh, territory uh, makes it too important to fall. If we go to the third slide, Chinese firms uh, actually rely very heavily on Hong Kong as a key source of foreign funding. 73% of uh, offshore uh, initial public offerings by mainland firms uh, take place in Hong Kong, uh, took place in Hong Kong between 2010 and 2018. Uh, and Hong Kong also provides a, a gateway through which Western investors uh, can access the mainland stock market via the Hong Kong Shanghai Stock Connect scheme. Hong Kong is a key hub, if we go to the fourth slide, uh, for mainland firms when they are seeking to raise foreign currency, uh, particularly US dollar uh, bonds. And the city uh, mediates nearly two thirds of direct investment uh, into and out of China. It's also the largest offshore center for bond sales by Chinese companies, uh, around 60% of their US dollar bond listings taking place in Hong Kong between 2017 and 2019. If we go to the next slide, Hong Kong is also Asia's preeminent financial services center. Uh, over 1,500 multinationals have their uh, regional headquarters in Hong Kong, an increase of two thirds since 1997. And on to the next slide. In, re in researching this report, uh, we in Hong Kong Watch um, spoke directly with a range of business leaders. And I, I should say, you know, business is not our core focus. Our focus is Hong Kong's human rights, freedoms, uh, autonomy, and the rule of law. But we recognize that the importance of Hong Kong as a financial center uh, needed to be emphasized uh, to advance the case for protecting uh, its uh, core freedoms. And so we spoke with a range of business leaders who underlined that the reason the uh, city plays such an important role in the region is those very qualities which make it unique, uh, particularly freedom of capital, freedom of information, freedom of expression, rule of law, autonomy, uh, as well as uh, low taxation and deregulation. Our report uh, in the next slide uh, outlines why there's no other Chinese city, um, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, no other Chinese city uh, that shares or can replicate uh, these uh, qualities. And nor can China easily look elsewhere. Singapore would perhaps be the most obvious competitor, but its stock market is less than one tenth of the size of Hong Kong's. And it's not clear that any other city uh, can adequately replace Hong Kong. Its combination of access to mainland China and uh, common law, rule of law system and way of life is truly unique. So with all these slides, we can see uh, the importance of Hong Kong as an international financial center, both to uh, the international community, but also to China itself. And I believe we must make the case that it is in China's interests to respect the one country, two systems model and the rule of law. The current trajectory, as, as we've heard from uh, the previous speakers, um, looking at the imposition of Article 23, the, the recent arrests uh, and, and other examples, 
will ultimately backfire uh, for the CCP. Uh, and, and China won't be the only part of the world that is impacted. Uh, with over 900,000 uh, Hong Kong Canadians uh, living in Hong Kong and Canada, um, Canada has uh, an important stake in this game, of course, as does my own country, the United Kingdom. We have a special responsibility to Hong Kong through the Sino-British Joint Declaration, but, but Canada, as a key ally, um, has an important role and a direct interest uh, in standing up for uh, China, uh, standing up to China and defending Hong Kong's freedoms and human rights. Uh, it's often pointed out that uh, uh, China is Canada's second largest uh, trading partner, and the argument is made that Canada can't afford to upset China. But if we go to the next slide, let's look at the numbers. Canada's exports to China amount, correct me if I'm wrong, Canadians, please, because I wouldn't want as a Brit to be telling you things that, are, uh, that you know or that are wrong. But if I'm correct, uh, your export, exports amount to just 3.9% uh, in 2019. So Canada, and the same point is made about the United Kingdom, we don't rely uh, on China. Um, Canada's biggest trading partner is the United States, uh, accounting for 75% uh, of exports. And the second largest partner is, of course, the European Union. And among the Five Eyes nations, uh, Canada is actually the one, I believe, that is least reliant on China. But even Australia, which among the Five Eyes nations uh, is the most reliant on China, with 38% uh, of its exports going to, to China in 2019, Australia is stepping up, uh, as we all know, is, is leading the international effort demanding an international, international independent investigation into the causes of the pandemic, uh, along with 120 other countries. So in view of all of this, and in view of the close ties between Canada, the United Kingdom and Hong Kong, uh, I believe uh, Canada uh, uh, can take the following actions to defend Hong Kong's freedoms. And I conclude with these recommendations. Um, firstly, I would uh, be delighted if um, the Canada-China Relations uh, Committee that I know uh, you're uh, a key part of um, could schedule a, a hearing in, in Parliament when it's possible to do so uh, on Hong Kong. This kind of webinar is extremely welcome, um, but if you were to have a formal uh, hearing, that would be very positive. Um, we would encourage you to, uh, to consider uh, accepting, uh, when it's necessary, uh, asylum seekers uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, according to the Globe and, and, and Mail, uh, there are over 40 uh, Hong Kong asylum seekers already uh, in Canada. And if things deteriorate, uh, more Hong Kongers will feel in vulnerable situations and our countries, the United Kingdom and Canada, I think have a responsibility to help. Uh, and finally, I know that you have a Magnitsky uh, Act. Uh, we, we have one in the UK as well, although it's in the process of, of completing its uh, secondary legislation. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, I would encourage you to use uh, Magnitsky legislation to sanction officials in uh, the central government and the Hong Kong government who are responsible for either directly or, or, or complicitly uh, violations of human rights uh, in Hong Kong. In addition to all the reasons that I've set out here, that, that Hong Kong matters as an international financial center, I just uh, finally repeat uh, the, the message about Hong Kong's importance as a symbol of uh, openness uh, in Asia, where until recently, even though it hasn't had a fully democratic political system, Hong Kong has had freedom of expression, a free press, and basic human rights. Those values were promised to Hong Kong before the handover. They're guaranteed under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which has already been emphasized is an international treaty lodged at the United Nations. And if the Chinese Communist Party continues to break its promises uh, to Hong Kong and trample all over Hong Kong's freedoms, it is both an assault on uh, the freedom of uh, Hong Kong but it's also an assault on uh, freedom for all of us and an attack uh, on the international rules-based system. And so uh, I assure you that I'm passionately pushing my own government and parliament uh, to live up to its promises under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, but I believe it is a responsibility for all of us who care about these values and Canada has a vital role to play. So 
thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to say that. Well, thank you uh, so much, Ben, for that excellent presentation. Uh, ben and I have, have known each other for quite a few years, and he's been a great resource for me on uh, on so many different issues. So, uh, Ben, we we Canadians don't have any problem taking advice, at least from certain Brits who uh, who are are very knowledgeable about uh, topics like this. So, um, appreciate that. And some of the points you're making about policy are ones that I I already saw showing up in some of the comments on the live stream. People asking about the issue of asylum, as well as Magnitsky. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that'll be something we could get into in the discussion. So, uh, folks, we, we have this discussion scheduled to go for about another 35 minutes. And uh, so we're going to move right now into questions and discussion, especially from uh, folks that are on this, uh, this Zoom call here. Uh, we've got uh, parliamentarians, we've got parliamentary staff, and uh, some members of the media as well. Uh, so please use the raise hand function. And if you're watching live uh, on uh, on Facebook and you have a question that you'd like to, to come up, uh, please post a comment on the live stream and I'll uh, do my best to, to share some of those questions as well. I expect we'll get some familiar themes in both places. So just go ahead and use the, uh, the hand raise function and I will uh, work through uh, those, uh, those comments and those questions as we go. Uh, for our for our first uh, intervention, uh, though, I, I want to uh, bring in Joey Siu, uh, who is a uh, who is a student activist in Hong Kong uh, and someone who who can share some more perspective about what's happening on the ground. Uh, she's been to Canada to meet with uh, parliamentarians here. We had an opportunity to meet while she was uh, in Canada. I, I think we did a Hong Kong watch briefing at which you you spoke, Joey, if I remember right. Yeah. Okay. So. So would appreciate, uh, especially those that had a chance to hear from you before, an update in terms of what's what's been happening lately from, uh, from your perspective, and then we'll go right into questions and comments from uh, from everybody else. So please, again, the hand raise function, and we'll we'll go to that right after uh, Joey. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. So a lot has been going on in Hong Kong during the past few weeks, including the, the, the several statements from the liaison office of China and Hong Kong threatening that they would be disqualifying pro-democracy lawmakers in the Legislative Council, and also including the reintroduction of the National Anthem Law, which will be passed on the 27th of May, and also for tonight about the National Security Law and about the implementation of it in Hong Kong. So it is actually, the situation in Hong Kong is, as you might all think, that is deteriorating in a very, very unpredicted and also in a very, very fast pace, which is very worrying not to not only to Hong Kongers, but also to the other countries in the international community, where the very unique status of, of Hong Kong is being threatened. And Hong Kong might not be might not might no longer be acting as a very special international financial center anymore after the implementation of the national security law. And up until yesterday, there were 8,600 of us arrested, over 1,000 of us prosecuted, and among them, there are 600 of us being charged with rioting, where the minimum imprisonment could be up, on, up to six to seven years which is a very, very heavy punishment. And with the implementation of the national security law, we can actually foresee a lot more arrests in Hong Kong happening. So that is also why we had been trying to lobby the different kinds of like politicians and also foreign governments to grant and to work on granting the asylum status to different to different like political refugees from Hong Kong to Canada and also to the other countries. And we also find it very, very important to make use of the Global Magnitsky Act to sanction those human rights abuses in, in the Hong Kong government and also in the Chinese Communist government. And that is also why we had been trying to go on to several lobbying trips into different countries. And it would be really, really helpful if the if Canada can be with us on this on this like sanctioning and also on our way to to pursue democracy in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joy, for that as well. Um, 
we're, I'm not seeing questions in the chat so far. I have a whole bunch of questions, and uh, so let me let me kick off with one, and then uh, and then we'll go uh, we'll be on there. In terms of Magnitsky sanctions, uh, has has uh, somebody drawn up a list of the specific you know the the first five people that that uh, could be sanctioned, where there's sort of the most clear overwhelming evidence, uh, and have any other countries uh, started to, to do this because it it does make the process of making the case, you know, if, if uh, Canadian parliamentarians can say, uh, you know, these people were were sanctioned in this country on the basis of this clear record, so so we should adopt those same same sanctions. If it, does anybody want to want to jump in on that? Yes, I would like to answer the question. So student organizations and also other Hong Kongers organizations in Hong Kong have already dropped a list on, of those human rights abusers who had been committing crimes in Hong Kong and also from China. And we had been sending the list to different government officials, including government officials in the United States, and we're willing to send it to you or other who, who wants to take a look at the list and to get a direction on who to sanction and what did they do in Hong Kong. And I believe with the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act in the United States and also with the European Union considering the implementation of the Global Magnitsky Act, it would be very, very useful if all these countries could be gathering a joint effort in sanctioning human rights abuses in Hong Kong and also in China. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, the, the power of Magnitsky Act is in the coordination, right? Because if, if only one country applies Magnitsky sanctions, then uh, effectively the, the person still has a lot of other options when it comes to uh, emigrating, vacationing, what, you know, moving their money, et cetera. So, okay, we've got, uh, we got the, the chat moving now. So go, I'll go ahead and start with uh, uh, Joseph uh, has a question. Yes, I'll, okay, thank you for unmuting me. Um, I work, it, it's not exactly a question yet. I have some uh, personal experience and also observation to share, uh, but I hope someone can offer me like uh, possible solutions. Um, I work in the Cantonese ethnic media. So whenever we try to talk about the situation of Hong Kong, we receive so many uh, complaints online, offline, uh, email, phone to our, our radio station. At, and that creates a lot of pressure uh, from our uh, management team. Although they did not bother our uh, freedom of speech, but the pressure is uh, getting more and more, uh, um, like bigger and bigger, heavier and heavier uh, is there. And I also have heard uh, from some, like we are Cantonese speaking uh, from Hong Kongers. So we don't um, get as much uh, threats as to the uh, mainland Chinese. I have people coming to me uh, stating that they uh, try to say something uh, which is right uh, for humanity, for democracy on WeChat. And they have been, uh, with their uh, office or their home address exposed and they get uh, some sort of uh, trouble from uh, the other uh, people who are pro uh, uh, CCP here in Canada. So is there anything that we can do about this uh, situation? Because we don't feel safe, we don't feel that our uh, freedom of speech is um, being protected. Uh, hi, this is Avery. Uh, maybe I can chip in uh, with some some uh, observation or analysis. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, what Joseph has uh, described uh, is uh, is a you know the result of very very uh, long lasting hard work by the CCP through resources uh, through. Um, participations in various uh, small community uh, in sipping through or selling uh, selling the value of uh, nationalism uh, or patriot uh, you know the, the so-called patriotic value um, so and 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 that is a very strong uh, tool uh, for uh, for the CCP and even uh, for example over the past uh, 12 months 
uh, with the anti-extradition bill uh, movement. Uh, CCP has been very craftily employing the nationalist, uh, nationalistic uh, rhetoric in consolidating their support uh, within the mainland China and then in, in an effect to alienate any uh, dissident voice to a simplistic view of uh, sedition or, or a separatist movement or whatever they, they want to frame it. Um, and, our, and, and, and the key message is they have successfully equate CCP, uh, well, CCP, the party, equate to the Chinese people and vice versa as well. And, and you know, is there a solution for Joseph? Not really. Uh, and then the problem is uh, with the coronavirus pandemic uh, and the rising xenophobia uh, overseas, you know, people are also, even on the extreme right, is buying the same rhetoric is the Chinese people equals CCP. And that is exactly what C the CCP wants. Um, so it's something that we, uh, uh, even on the international inter uh, international uh, political scene, we have to tackle uh, to separate the, the actual regime who doesn't really have any mandate uh, at all uh, from the actual people. And I, I understand that it, it is going to be extremely hard. I mean, even locally in Hong Kong uh, that even till today, 40% of Hong Kong citizens, at least on the, in the voting booth, are still in support of uh, you know, uh, uh, Hong Kong government or the Beijing government. Uh, and many of, their, uh, many of them, their thinking is really boils down to that uh, nationalistic pride or the, the fake nationalistic pride. Um, so, so, you know, uh, there's, we don't have a solution, but there's something that we have to be strongly aware of when we uh, are dealing with China. And, um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, Avery. I'll, I'll just add, Joseph, because I think, I think a big part of your question was about what we in Canada as, as legislators can do about these issues, and, and maybe some of the other parliamentarians want to chime in on this. Um, I mean, I, I think Avery's right on point that uh, extremists on both sides want to uh, want to say that that China is the CCP and that the Chinese people are the CCP. They, they try and connect two things which in fact need to be decoupled. And that's true of the CCP rhetoric as well as the rhetoric from um, extremists, xenophobes on the other side who want to blame all, all Chinese people. And, and I think uh, rhetorically that that decoupling is really important, which is which is why I try to be very intentional about talking, about my own uh, deep admiration for Chinese history, Chinese culture, um, uh, while also criticizing uh, a, a, a political system which I think betrays that history and that and that culture. Uh, Joseph, I think I think we need to do more in Canada to to protect uh, cultural minority communities in particular from the impacts of, of foreign influence operations because we we know that that whether it's the Chinese government or or other governments that. That often it's uh, recent immigrants and and minority communities that that can uh, face the brunt of, uh, of of often coordinated abuses when you try and, and raise issues and uh, it's critically important that we take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that uh, that everybody is free in Canada uh, and uh, I don't I don't have all of the answers but I think this is something that our Canada China Relations Committee uh, as, as well as other committees need to study. Uh, and uh, there are there are probably a lot of little steps we can take around this, whether it's uh, uh, ensuring that um, uh, you know in, ensuring that that acts of intimidation are 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 dealt with, that diplomats who are involved in acts of intimidation uh, or or inappropriate political organizing are expelled. Um, you know, we we can we can deal with each of the individual cases through effective enforcement uh, and. Um, you know, and the government certainly, and I've said this this publicly. You know, when when there's there's coordinated intimidation or efforts to suppress free speech by diplomats, uh, those diplomats always need to be expelled right away. So some some of those kinds of steps we could take to protect freedom. Kenny, did you want to weigh in on that? And then uh, I've got yeah. uh, we've got a yeah, Garnet, uh, just yeah. just want to add to uh, to what you and Avery uh, have said, and in response to Joseph. Uh, comment. I think right now in the Chinese community, I sense the, a, a high sense of insecurity. Uh, 
uh, among the Canadian um, citizens of Chinese descent. Um, there has been quite a few um, racist and borderline on hatred um, incidents that actually happen across Canada. Uh, even, even in Montreal, for example, native Indians have been misidentified as Chinese, has been has been uh, mistreated or even uh, beat, beaten up in Vancouver as well. And so uh, the community is actually uh, quite concerned. And that probably is one of the reasons why they, they want to um, uh, stay away from criticizing uh, China. And uh, they figure that uh, because they, they are identified as Chinese and criticizing China may actually cost them even more trouble uh, for themselves. And to respond to this uh, insecurity, I, I think that that is exactly why um, we parliamentarians and as a democratic country, uh, we need to stand with them uh, for those who've been um, mistreated, who's been uh, discriminated against uh, by all these actions. We, we need to stand with them and, uh, you know, present a very strong um, opposition line that this is not acceptable in Canada, um, but at the same time, from the same mouth, we, we need to criticize where it matters. Um, if it is the CCP government, it is the CCP government. Um, Joseph, I think, uh, you know, for um, community, community leaders such as yourself and, um, you know, parliamentarian like, like myself uh, and others, we could definitely um, help educate the um, communities in Canada that uh, we are Canadians. Uh, we have to stand strong. Uh, what happened to the Japanese community uh, during the Second World War will not happen in Canada. We have learned the lesson. I think this is one, one of the responses we could actually provide to, uh, to our fellow Canadians. Thank you, Kenny. We'll go to, we'll go to Andrea and then uh, Tamara. And uh, uh, if people want to join the discussion, either to ask a question or to respond to something someone else said, just do use that, uh, that hand raise function. So uh, go ahead, uh, Andrea. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. And um, I appreciate all the speakers whom I must commend for their courage. I guess my question actually really relates to what uh, Garnett, you and uh, Kenny have just alluded to. But more specifically, I do also freelance in the uh, Cantonese uh, media. But more specifically, the situation in Hong Kong right now is extremely, extremely dire. Given our current condition or parliamentary condition in Canada, what realistic chances of, of parliamentarians being able to do anything for this, for, for, to advance the cause of Hong Kong? I, I don't mean to just theoretically say we could do this, that, and the other thing, but given the, the, the urgency of the matter, could you, uh, maybe you and Kenny can comment on that if other speakers can comment as well. Thank you. Sure, Kenny, do you wanna go first here? Yeah, sure. Um, Andrea, if I, if I may draw the, um, experience that we use on Taiwan, um, the the governing. I, I have to put on my partisan uh, hat right now. Um, the governing liberals are fence sitters. Um, they they are um, hesitant to act, and they they prefer not to um, antagonize the the Chinese tiger. They see it, and that that's why they they've been not acting uh, on many of the. Um, incidents that actually would have protected more uh, Canadians and Canadian interests. Uh, but on the file of Taiwan, for example, um, the conservative, the opposition conservative has been uh, hammering them and pounding them on why not supporting Taiwan to join or rejoin the WHA and the WHO. And, uh, you know, after questions after questions, many of them led by parliamentarian even started from last year, like Garnet's, um, you know, finally, we, we see that they, they are changing their, their uh, approach and they have announced that they will be supporting Taiwan to rejoin the uh, WHO. That to me serves as, um, as um, insight to what we could do. Um, we must not let down the political pressure on the government. Um, it, it, you know, Hong Kong, it's at a cri critical juncture right now, and uh, we must continue to, uh, through, you know, personal level, individual level, uh, applying pressures, but also on organizations such as Hong Kong Watch, as well as parliamentarian uh, representing the people 
of Canadians, uh, such as Garnett and myself and many other colleagues here, uh, we must coordinate a, um, a joint attack, uh, keep up the pressure, uh, keep up the, uh, the demands. And I think that would actually have effect on the government. Thanks, Kenny. And, and, and just to add, you know, the, um, the, well, the challenge we're facing right now is we're having a debate about whether and in what form Parliament should resume. Because we have these extraordinary sessions that are happening uh, digitally uh, and one a week in person. Uh, but those are, are not formally sittings of Parliament. They are sittings of a, of a committee set up to study the issue of COVID-19. And we had a case yesterday where a question, uh, it, was, it was a domestic policy issue, but it was a question unrelated notionally to, to COVID-19, which the, the chair ruled out of order, couldn't be asked. So uh, we, we have this problem without Parliament sitting and, and the accountability sessions only being oriented to the COVID response. Uh, frankly, we don't have the tools that we normally have as parliamentarians to drive these issues. And it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the international context situation, Hong Kong and elsewhere is, is one of many reasons why, uh, why some of us are taking the position that are, are, are returned, not of all members of parliament, all coming in 338 being in the same room, but of some, um, you know, some, some modified format where we can uh, still have parliament function and ask a broad range of questions is, uh, is, uh, is quite important. Uh, Tamara, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I see a few people waving, at, um, but um, yeah, okay. Uh, let, let me let me go to Tamara first, and then we'll bring in uh, Ben and and Lee uh, after that. So go ahead, Tamara. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for for putting this all on like this. Um, I I wanted to begin by saying uh, you have my my deepest uh, regard that you are you as speakers are willing to put yourselves out there on this issue um, at personal risk. It, it is amazing to see you being willing to do this on behalf of others. It's, it's truly uh, uh, heartwarming. Um, I, I have to say, I think we as Canadians have the challenge in that we, we've been lulled into this concept that uh, China has become democratic because of all the work that we've been able to do with uh, different Chinese companies. Our, our own company, uh, previous to me being a, a, <clears throat> a member of parliament, was doing business with China, and it and it it appears like uh, they're democratic, and so a lot of us think that they are. But the longer that we went to China, the more we started to recognize it was getting worse yet again. It was closing back down. Um, uh, rules were were really being uh, pushed that hadn't been when we first started back. Uh, oh man, in the 90s, I guess. So I think that's a challenge. We are going to have to um, help Canadians understand that China has changed. Uh, or I shouldn't say changed. It, 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 it looked like it changed, but it really hadn't. And so it's important that we talk about China as a communist regime. Like you say, it's not the people. It's, it's the China, Chinese uh, government, which is a communist regime, which continues to um, hold back individual uh, um, uh, freedoms. Uh, so just, I, I want to, again, thank you very much for coming on and, and helping us to understand this. And I, I just tell you here in my own writing, I have had the wonderful um, opportunity to meet uh, many uh, Chinese Canadians who, who uh, love Canada and are concerned about their family and friends back in China. And um, they actually helped us to understand here in Langley how uh, bad the coronavirus flu was because um, at the time that was in uh, that was just before Chinese New Year on the Monday they did a beautiful cultural dance for us we had a, a presentation and they were prepping for their big one which was going to be on the Saturday here in Langley and they ended up cancelling that because they understood the uh, the danger that it posed uh, gathering together under the circumstances and I believe that here in our in, in the Fraser Valley because of our Chinese Canadian friends they helped us to uh, avoid a, a worse outbreak here because they would actually go as volunteers to the airport pick people up and, uh, and, and keep them quarantined so that they wouldn't spread uh, the virus here in the Fraser Valley. So I'm just so thankful for, for the things they have done for us. Um, they really took care of us. And um, uh, I, I think we need to make sure that people understand uh, the Chinese government, uh, the communist regime is really, really our, our enemy here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tamara. Let's uh, let's bring uh, Lee back into the discussion here. Lee was uh, trying to get my attention earlier. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the, the timing is very urgent, I would like to say, because, uh, you know, as I've said, the national security law is coming tonight and then it will be passed uh, in Beijing in August. Is, uh, that's what they are trying to report uh, uh, in Hong Kong. So we have a time frame problem. So I think as uh, Kenny had mentioned that uh, is the government on board on this? I mean, the Canadian government is the Liberal Party on board. If they are not on board and if the government are not speaking out, I hope more government have to speak out at this very, very urgent time. So the situation is very dire. Time, the time frame is very urgent. And I appeal that, you know, we have to act in this few weeks or hopefully one week time of all the government in the world, uh, even if there's possibility of UN, uh, United Nations uh, uh, mechanism, to really stand with Hong Kong uh, on our very dang the threat of you know taking away uh, our freedom and democracy uh, our freedom and civil liberty through the national security uh, law and it's imposing Hong Kong uh, implanting the national security on on Hong Kong and secondly I I, the, I want to make the point that actually that's where where's the where's the dirty trick of the Communist Party is that when the world is having the pandemic problem. You know, uh, and it's distracted to that. They do all this dirty work in Hong Kong. And of course, I think there's another point I want to make is that sometimes we also have to be concerned about what happening inside China, especially those who reported on COVID-19 inside China, the whistleblower. Uh, the, there are a few of the, uh, what we call, um, uh, you know, journalists, civil journalists or, or uh, that are trying to report what is happening in Wuhan, they have disappeared. They are they and to and we are really very urgently appealing also for the release. So I think we have also to go back into what happening inside China with this COVID nineteen when the exposure of the the virus to the world is also because of what happened inside China and what is a human right issue inside China. Also, when uh, those who try to report on it and try to be uh, spreading words about warning to, of it was being arrested and and uh, and detained. So I think this is also another front, apart from our Hong Kong front, that I hope the, the world should also be concerned of what is happening inside. Since they are, you know, trying to play the dirty trick during a pandemic, and what are they, how they are treating their own people uh, who expose on pandemic is also a very much of a violation, uh, breach, violation of human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, we'll go to, to Ben and then Martin, and then I'll take the question from Lewis after that. Thank you very much. My apologies for using the old-fashioned way. I couldn't find the raise hand button, so I just did it myself. But um, I just wanted to pick up very quickly on two uh, points. The, the first is the point that was made earlier about the need to coordinate. I think it was in re reference to Magnitsky sanctions, but I think it applies more generally. Um, I have been advocating for some months uh, the idea of uh, establishing uh, an international contact group uh, of like-minded governments uh, concerned about Hong Kong, because one of the things I find is that the United Kingdom uh, has a particular responsibility uh, uh, under the Joint Declaration, but it always says, you know, we can't do this alone. When I talk to other governments, they say we're, we're willing to help, but where is the United Kingdom? They should be leading. And actually, if we had an international contact group where allies, um, traditional allies like Canada, the United Kingdom, European countries, United States, Australia, but also if we can find democratic allies in the region, Japan, Korea, uh, perhaps uh, some Southeast Asian nations as well, um, to, to really coordinate international efforts at this critical time, uh, I think that would be a really good thing to do. Um, and I can say now, because he said this publicly for the first time yesterday, that the last governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, uh, strongly supports this idea. And he said so at an event at the Foreign Correspondence Club in Hong Kong yesterday. And there are further initiatives uh, afoot to press the British government to take a lead uh, on this. But if, if Canada was willing to support such an idea, uh, I think that would be very positive. 
And then just very briefly on the issue of um, the need to counter uh, Sinophobia, I very strongly agree with what's been said about this. I, I love China. I, I first went to China when I was 18. Uh, I went many, many times until it was no longer possible to go because the CCP don't seem to like me very much. They don't like any of us very much. Um, and, uh, but but I, the point is I, I love China and the people. Um, and I took part a few days ago in a podcast with uh, the think tank Civitas uh, in London with an academic called Andreas Fulda on this issue of uh, changing policy towards the CCP whilst countering Sinophobia. And if that would be of interest to, to anybody and, and anybody who has the time to watch it, I'm happy to send a copy. It's on YouTube, but I'm happy to send a copy perhaps to Dale to make available to anyone who'd be interested in that because we kind of un unpick some of the themes in that uh, in more, more detail. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ben. Uh, Martin, over to you. You're, you're still on mute, though. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Am I Great. right? Yeah, yeah. Now, on the Magnitsky Act, of course, the best thing is to have many, many more countries to introduce such acts and then act together in conjunction. But at the same time, you need a goal. I mean, well, how does it help, help Hong Kong if a number, a large number of our government servants are, are then targeted? And even some in Beijing, for example. There must be a long objective, a, a, a goal in front of you. And that is exactly what Deng Xiaoping laid out for Hong Kong. That's why I always go back to that. Because once you insist that China honor her promises in the, before the world the community, now that's an important message to China. Now, don't you think you can get away with Hong Kong like this? We're writing the Joint Declaration and standing down Xiaoping's one can be two systems on its set. No, we do not accept it in Hong Kong. So I hope the international community would not accept it and, and think, well, unfortunately, it's gone. Don't, don't let them get away with it. Hold them to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think this will uh, be the last question uh, and then we can take uh, responses or wrap up uh, comments from presenters and then uh, Kenny will, will have some concluding remarks at the end. Um, and that may take us a, a little past our scheduled uh, end time, but we'll, we'll try to end uh, close to it. Uh, for my part, thank you again to all those who participated. Uh, there have been a number of, of members of parliament. I saw uh, Heather McPherson here uh, from the NDP. Thank you for joining us. As, joining us as well as uh, Ziad Abeltif uh, Tamara uh, from, uh, from our Conservative Caucus. And, and there may have been others that I didn't see. I think Senator Green was on the call as well. Uh, and there may be others who I didn't notice. So thank you. Thank you to all the parliamentarians as well as everybody else for joining us. Uh, so for our, for our final question or intervention, uh, over to you, uh, Lewis. Hello, Genus. I'm Yasmin Rotansi. I was here too, listening to oh. you. Oh, great. I, that, I couldn't that. even raise my hand because it, I'm on a phone and I really okay. wanted to ask a question, but that's okay. We will discuss later. Thanks. You, you, you know what? No, uh, Yasmin, if you have a question, thank you for joining us and uh, go ahead and ask your question. I, uh, yeah, I, it just says iPhone, so I didn't know, but, but uh, um, yeah. maybe if you, you, you pose your question and then Lewis will pose her question, then we'll take responses together. Okay. And my question was, um, I know that somebody asked the similar question about Canada's role, and I please do not give me a political answer because governments, as you know, need to manage relationships. And we know that uh, China can take certain actions against Canada. So diplomatically, I need to know how we as Canadians can help Hong Kong because Hong Kong is very critical to the whole uh, relationship between Canada and China. So if somebody can give me some practical ideas as to how we collectively, civil society and parliamentarians can do it, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, Yasmin's a, a member of the, the governing party and, and uh, has, has been a, a parliamentarian for a very long time, brings a, a wealth of experience. So thank you for being here and for your commitment to these issues. Um, sorry, sorry about uh, breaking the order there, Lewis, but, uh, but go ahead. 
Uh, thank you. Can you, can everyone? Yes, hear? yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I just want to bring some news from the ground and local. Long story short, I am a political writer and reporter. What I'd like to offer is more like an additional discussion, more than a question related to what we have discussed. Recently, the re situation has become more and more disturbing and worrying. At the same time, the idea of Hong Kong independence has been more and more popular, especially among young people and new generation. Similar example, but not exactly the same, the Quebec independence in Canada. Theoretically, everything could and should be discussed. It should be legal to explore possibilities and ideas peacefully. However, there is no room for peaceful discussion for independence for Hong Kong here. Referring to the national security law, plus advocator of that idea, like Hong Kong National Party, was quickly banned. Uh, and those individuals who support similar ideas has been constantly suppressed and having their political right to be elected disqualified. We believe basic human why right is more important than any particular sovereignty and the prime possibility responsibility of sovereignty is a responsibility to protect its citizens basic human right if it is not the case here so the sovereignty and the chinese right to rule is very questionable at least for many young generation uh, for those who uh, who was born after the handover. Um, after all, I personally think that the handover of Hong Kong is not unconditional. It comes with the responsibility to maintain the freedom and prosperity Hong Kong has been enjoying for decades, with Chinese, which is Chinese government failed to do so. They are challenging Hong Kong as well as challenging the free world, referring to the experience of Joseph, this wish control is spreading to the free world like the virus. Actually, I don't know what will happen to the advocator of independence of Hong Kong after the pass of the national security law. So that is already a front line in Hong Kong to oppose to those uh, to suppression of human rights. But we uh, we hope to see the international front line also. We reform as soon as possible. More and more moral and tactic courage are always welcome and need nowadays. It is time for international community as a whole to work on an independence from the totalitarian system of China. So we like to see uh, fun line so this is what i want to share thank you thank you lewis for for sharing your perspective um it, let's just go go back to a final round through our speakers uh in response to any of that and also uh, uh mr tansy's question very specifically drilling down on on the practical responses in the context of managing the relationship uh we've also had a similar question come in from uh Clarice Pang of Citizen News asking about if and to what extent uh, Canada can use economic leverage uh, to, to, to pressure China. So uh, drilling down a bit further on the uh, on the Canadian response. Um, ben, you're you're uh, you're very engaged on the on the politics side. Do you want to kick off responses to that, and then and then maybe some of our other speakers will want to wade in. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, although um, our, our friends from Hong Kong, I'm sure, will have uh, more to, to add. Um, but I would say, really, to summarize some of the points that I've already uh, offered, I think um, the first and most important thing is, is to really speak out uh, as strongly and robustly and repeatedly uh, as possible. I, I think that uh, what we've seen in terms of my own government in the UK um, I, I won't make too much comment on Canada's government uh, itself, but, but, but other governments around the world, um, is that uh, 
that the, the level of response has not been proportionate to the severity of the situation. Um, if there's any government that has been uh, more robust than others, it's been the United States. Um, but even, even there, there's not uh, always consistency. So I think um, a much more robust, uh, consistent, repeated message from all our governments is really important. Um, secondly, the, the idea of an international contact group, I think, is, is really important. I think there's strength in numbers. And if our individual governments feel that the pressure of China uh, on, on us alone is daunting, you know, if we stick together, we, we, we are more likely to have an effect. Thirdly, we've talked about Magnitsky sanctions. I very much agree with Martin Lee that um, there's only a purpose to Magnitsky sanctions if they are linked to a desired outcome. Uh, there's no point in having sanctions in perpetuity with, with, with no um, incentive to, uh, to act. So, so they should be linked to uh, the restoration of and the, up, and the upholding of the promises made to the people of Hong Kong and the preservation of, of one country, two systems. Um, so I think those would probably be my, my three highlights. Just a very brief comment on, um, on Lewis's uh, uh, comment. Um, it's not for me to tell Hong Kong people what they should or shouldn't uh, desire or, or think, but all I would say is from an international advocacy perspective, uh, I know that advocating independence for Hong Kong is not uh, a viable, realistic uh, um, advocacy message. I'm not saying Hong Kongers individually shouldn't think that, if that's what they feel in their hearts, and I can understand why they might feel it. But Hong Kong Watch, uh, our position is very strongly to support uh, one country, two systems, to support the promises made to the people of Hong Kong, uh, and, uh, and we don't advocate uh, independence. That said, we do support freedom of expression, and when um, the Hong Kong National Party were banned, we, uh, as did the British Foreign Office, spoke out against that. We made it clear we don't agree with them, we don't advocate Hong Kong independence, but we support their right to, to air peacefully such views. And so very briefly, somebody tweeted me at the time saying to me, somebody from Hong Kong saying to me, well, how would you feel if, uh, if advocates of Scottish independence uh, were allowed to stand for your parliament? And I replied saying, they're the third largest party in our parliament. <laughs> and uh, you have the same situation, or at least have had uh, with Quebec. Yeah. So, so I think there's an important message to get across that I personally don't advocate independence. I don't think it's helpful to the cause, but it, I'm not going to uh, tell other people that they shouldn't think that, and it, they certainly shouldn't be criminalized uh, for doing so. Thank you, thank you very much. And the, the point about collective action, it, strengthening our response, that if countries are able through mechanisms to act together, uh, and that makes them less vulnerable to uh, kind of uh, bilateral retaliation is, I think, uh, critical for us. Uh, Lee, you had a you had a point, I think, right? I got it. The importance of an international uh, solidarity group, you know, everywhere, Europe, uh, Canada, uh, uh, UK, you know, everywhere in the world, US, uh, Australia, everywhere. There should be an international support group so that you know there can be a coordinated international effort uh, to uh, stand by Hong Kong. And and uh, the situation now is very clear. Uh, one country, two system is no longer there. You know, it's almost like one country, one system when they introduced the National Security Act. And so the world can have a very clear uh, responsibility because you are all witness to the joint declaration and you have all the uh, apart from responsibility, they also have the, you know, in a way, the right, you know, as an international community to, to, to say to China that, you know, they are going, they, their intervention uh, in destroying one country with the system is breaking their promise uh, as a nation. So I think this, you know, uh, very clear common uh, stand uh, should be out as soon as uh, possible. And, and secondly, I think uh, back to the question about leverage um of course you know i think uh, and also uh, very often there's a conflict between uh values and money or values and profit and so the everyone had to make a stand you know i think china of course had a, its economic power and it's if, if the world is going to just sacrifice 
uh, uh, you know, human rights, sacrifice, liberty, uh, values, uh, just for the profit, then, you know, this, this world is going to get worse. You know, I hope that we all can stand on firmly on the, on, on the issue of values. And, and of course, there may be short-term profit, but in the long run, I would say, you know, it is damaging to the whole world. If we just go after short-term profit and not long-term uh, uh, values that we all cherish uh, over the world. And so we, I think in this battle of values and money, I hope that people can be more on the, uh, on the side of that values. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, nobody reads 1984 by George Orwell and says, well, but what was their GDP? You know, did they have good economic growth? Uh, maybe it wasn't so bad, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, so much for, for great conversation. I'll hand it over to Kenny uh, for some wrap-up uh, remarks here before we adjourn. Sure, Garnet. Thank you. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank all our speakers for uh, joining this webinar today and uh, share your thoughts and concerns for Hong Kong. And I also want to thank uh, all the attendants in joining us, parliamentarian colleagues and also staffers, and to understand um, and get a bigger picture of why Hong Kong matters in this time. For me personally, the, the most vivid picture that I gained was um, you know, in 2019, when I was campaigning uh, to um, to uh, the Parliament of Canada, um, it, it, it's such a privilege, a, a sense of privilege, just you know, dawns on me that an immigrant uh, who who uh, educated uh, in your University of Saskatchewan, a foreign uh, student educated there, and a, a re recent, relatively recent immigrant. Uh, from Hong Kong was able to get elected in the uh, the core uh, power of of Canada, the House, the House of Commons of Canada's Parliament. It's it's such a privilege, and I I got a sweetest taste of democracy and and uh, you know equal freedom. And so and the ironic part is that uh, while while this is happening. Um, it, we were also watching on a nightly basis what happens, the development in Hong Kong. Um, the trajectory, uh, as previous speaker have said, of the situation in Hong Kong, it's actually not promising. Um, the, the development here in, in Canada also in our country has not also been very positive. Um, there is a mix of um, feeling. A lot of uh, people of Chinese descent had a, had a challenge in differentiating uh, the concept of race, nas nation, and the party. Criticizing the Communist Party of China, uh, um, com Chinese Communist Party, uh, would have been thought as, as criticizing the nation or the race. And these are, these are things that, as we discussed earlier, has to be sorted out uh, among us Canadians. But in, in, uh, in Hong Kong, we also learned that over 8,000 protesters have been arrested and over 1,000 uh, have already been charged. But to date, uh, if, if my uh, research is up to date, uh, there have been zero um, police been charged for police brutality. And we have seen more than enough for that. Why Hong Kong matters to Canada? Um, there, are, there are several points that I guess I could summarize. And the first one is business and trade. Uh, Hong Kong is the third largest financial market in Asia and Canada's second largest destination for foreign investment. Canada has over $10 billion invested in Hong Kong and Hong Kong has over 12 billion invested in Canada in just, just the financial matters itself. But as Lei Chao Yan has, has mentioned, money is not everything, uh, nor the most important value uh, we share with Hong Kong. Um, the future of China, for example, uh, it's also very close to our heart as Canadians. Uh, we, we want to have a bright future for Chinese in China. But we have seen students, lawyers, doctors, union leaders, religion practitioners being persecuted uh, unjustly. And these are all things that actually concern us. 
um, the history of Canada and Hong Kong, uh, as I have outlined earlier. Um, also, it's it's critical for for Canada to see a state stability uh, restored in Hong Kong. Um, we have, as we mentioned, hundreds of thousands of Canadians in Hong Kong, but at the same time, we also have uh, Hong Kongers, many Hong Kongers in Canada. Uh, behind me, you've you've probably wondered that uh, you know Canada must uh, Kenny must be reporting this or, or talking to you guys from a warehouse somewhere in Richmond, but no, these boxes are are actually uh, personal protective equipment that is actually being donated by Hong Kongers. They've taken the initiative, they've raised the money, they arranged the uh, to to source the material, and they shipped it at all their own expense. They, they want to donate these over 100,000 masks for Canada, but just because they, uh, they're concerned about Canada. And this is how um, intricately tied uh, of the two places. And finally, of course, we know Hong Kong matters because Hong Kong is also a symbol of openness and equality. And it is at the doorstep of closeness and authoritarianism. Um, I recently had a lot of time to spend at home. And so I, I re-watched a, a movie called Darkest Hour. It, it, it talks about the, the Churchill uh, era of uh, the, the British uh, history uh, at the doorstep of whether to join um, uh, the Second World War against the, the German uh, invasion in Europe, um, uh, Naval Chamberlain's appeasement policies, uh, how how close it is that UK will have decided to actually not join the Allies in fighting the war and the history would have been forever changed. Uh, Hong Kong's future is unavoidably linked to Canada. Uh, we must actually take action. And uh, for now, we will have to keep watch and uh, keep praying for Hong Kong. Well, we thank you for everybody to uh, to join with us and in this webinar today, and um, uh, thank you. And we conclude the uh, event today.